This is the kind of beauty that comes only when the artist knows he's working for the glory of God. Sir, may I have permission to take Molly on a sailing picnic around the island? Troy Donahue once had the world at his best with his remarkable acting skills, which won him several awards and accolades, but his indiscretions cost him everything. Coming from a wealthy family, Troy's rise to fame and tragic fall were shocking and unbelievably sad. But what's more disturbing about this icon's story is the startling guest who came to pay final rites at his funeral. Join us as we delve into the tragic story of the life and death of Troy Donahue. I don't intend to hurt her. What makes you think I would? Troy Donahue's Early Life Born on January 27, 1936, as Merle Johnson Jr. in New York General Hospital, Troy Donahue was the only son of Frederick Merle Johnson, a top General Motors director, and Edith Dede Johnson, a former famous Swedish stage actress. His upbringing was unlike that of many other celebrities, as he was born into wealth. The Johnson family was so rich that when Troy fell terribly ill with pneumonia at the tender age of six, his parents relocated the whole family to a five-acre property in Bayport, Suffolk County on Long Island. Hoping that the change in environment would aid young Troy's recovery, the family settled there for a while, even purchasing a variety of farm animals for Troy and his younger sister a year after the move. Life was like a bed of roses for Johnson's, until his stability was suddenly disrupted when Troy's father was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Over the course of two years, this ailment made Frederick's health deteriorate, plunging Troy into a period of turmoil. His behavior became erratic, and the once sweet boy started acting out and drinking excessively. Thinking that the worst had befallen Johnson's family, tragedy struck once again on December 5, 1950, when Troy's dad passed away at St. Albans Hospital in New York City. Young Troy was just 14 years old at the time, and his father's death had a profound impact on him, shaping the course of his life in ways he never could have imagined. Following his father's passing, tensions arose between Troy and his mother as he grieved his father, struggling to adjust to the family's twist of fate. The burden of emotions led the young Troy astray, and he dropped out when he was still in his second year of high school without his mother's consent. Determined to steer him back on track, his mother made the decisive move of sending him to the New York Military Academy. Initially feeling like an outsider in his new school, Troy's fortunes took a turn when he crossed paths with Francis Ford Coppola, the head of the school's drama team. Coppola not only welcomed him into the fold, but also cast him in school productions, laying the foundation for a lifelong friendship. While at the academy, Troy also delved into sports and even harbored aspirations of attending West Point. It looked as if life was once again stable for him, only to have his dreams dashed by a knee injury sustained during a track meet. Undeterred, he attempted to enlist in the army as an alternative, and he was dealt another fatal blow as he was rejected. At this point, Troy was left without options. All he had left was his love for acting. He resolved to pursue a career in entertainment despite objections from family members who wanted him to pursue a career in medicine or law. Troy's mind was already made, and as soon as he turned 18, he returned to New York securing a job as a messenger at Sound Masters, a film company, while concurrently pursuing studies in journalism at Columbia University. He even acted at summer stock in Bucks County and trained briefly with Ezra Stone, a family friend. Eager to kick off his acting career, Troy reached out to Daryl Brady, a friend of his father's working in the film industry in Los Angeles. And that was when his trajectory towards stardom took a significant leap. When the rain stops, I shall show you Verona. Oh, Romeo and Juliet's film. Even her balcony. Rise of the Icon in February 1956, Troy finally got feedback from Los Angeles. Brady extended an offer of employment and accommodation at his place in Calabasas. This was the beginning of Troy's journey to prominence in the world of entertainment. However, his acting dreams had to wait as he started with small, ordinary jobs. His first gig involved cutting film at Brady's company. Though the pay wasn't hefty, it was enough to get him a small apartment to rent in Malibu, near his mother and sister. Even as he worked on minor studio tasks on set, Troy still practiced acting line by line by himself, and one day, he eventually caught the eye of some of the industry's heavyweights of that period. William Asher and James Sheldon, who spotted him practicing as usual while they were having dinner in Malibu. They were so impressed that they arranged a screen test with Columbia Pictures for Troy. But just before the big day, 
Tragedy struck as the young talent was involved in a fatal car crash, leaving him with life-threatening injuries. This unfortunate incident dashed his hopes of sealing a deal with Columbia Pictures, but fate was not done with him. Because a year after the incident, fortune smiled upon Troy later that year. While practicing acting roles, he coincidentally crossed paths with actress Fran Bennett. The mega actress was so blown away by Troy's passion and natural acting skills that she connected him with her agent, Henry Wilson, who also managed Rock Hudson. Wilson was also impressed by Troy's talent after an act test, so he promptly signed Troy to his agency. But then, knowing all the pros and cons of the entertainment industry, the manager rechristened him Troy Donahue for a more camera-friendly appeal. And just like that, after eight months since moving to California, Troy had secured a six-month deal with Universal Studios, earning a modest $125 weekly. The young actor's new paycheck was enough to relocate him to North Hollywood, where he was able to fully kickstart his acting career with roles in films like Man Afraid, Man of a Thousand Faces, The Tarnished Angels, Above All Things, and The Monolith Monsters. In the midst of this newly found success, Troy's old habits not only resurfaced, they got worse, and in 1958, he would get into trouble for speeding under the influence, consequently costing him his deal with Universal Studios, which immediately left him financially strained and unable to pay his rent. Fortunately, his agent, Wilson, came to the rescue and arranged guest appearances on Western TV shows so as to help Troy secure a slightly smaller place in Hollywood. Indeed, Wilson's strategic move to get Troy more attention on television screens not only helped in keeping the bills afloat, but also in bagging roles in movies. Troy was able to land guest roles in shows like Man Without a Gun, This Happy Feeling, Wild Heritage, Voice in the Mirror, The Perfect Furlough, and Monster on the Campus, where he secured the fifth spot in the credits. Sir, may I have permission to take Molly on a sailing picnic around the island? Gradually, the TV strategy and guest roles helped in bagging more significant roles and guest appearances in episodes of The Californians, Rawhide, Wagon Train, Tales of Wells Fargo, and The Virginian. Troy's career was gaining momentum once again. But then the major breakthrough came in Warner Brothers' 1959 film A Summer Place, in which he played a role alongside Sandra Dee. The movie directed by Delmer Daves got mixed reviews from critics, but was still a massive success as it dominated the U.S. box office for two consecutive weeks. Its impact extended beyond the screen, as its music and scenes even appeared in other films like The Crowded Sky, Diner, and Ocean's Eleven. The movie was like a God-sent role, which instantly propelled Troy to instant stardom, particularly among teenagers. In fact, John L. Scott of the Los Angeles Times reviewed Troy as an actor with promise. Even the film Daily recognized Troy as one of the top five new talents of 1960, but the accolades did not stop there because the young actor would finally emerge as the most promising newcomer male in the 17th annual Golden Globe Award. In front of God and everybody this time? With fame came wealth, as Warner Brothers would capitalize on this huge breakthrough and sign Troy on a long-term contract, starting with a weekly salary of $400 and then sending him on a nationwide promotional tour. This was indeed Troy's peak, and he even tried capitalizing on this fame by testing waters in the music industry in the early 1960s. Warner Brothers Records backed him, and he was able to release singles like Live Young and Somebody Loves Me but none of them made it to the Billboard Hot 100 list. The rising star was rumored to be the lead actor in many high-budget movies that were about to be produced. There was even buzz surrounding him potentially starring in Aaliyah Kazan's 1961 movie, Splendor in the Grass, but the role later went to Warren Beatty. As the media promoted rumors, Warner Bros. was secretly preparing something big for their big actor. And to everyone's surprise, Troy became the cast member of the TV series Surfside Six, a spin-off of 77 Sunset Strip, set in Miami Beach, Florida. Troy shared the screen with Hollywood icons like Van Williams, Lee Patterson, Diane McBain, and Margarita Sierra. Boy, flat like a pancake. Catapulting him into the spotlight and making him a household name. Troy immediately became the most sought-after actor on national radio and TV stations, despite the hefty fees that Warner Brothers charged for his appearances. Sadly, the actor did not get a percentage of the profit gathered from his numerous media appearances. Warner Brothers had total control of the actor's media rights, and in no time, Troy's face was on several pieces of merchandise, from posters to lunchboxes to board games. 
Following the conclusion of Surfside 6, Troy joined the cast of Hawaiian Eye, another spin-off of 77 Sunset Strip, for its final season, which aired from 1962 to 1963. In this series, he perfectly played the role of Philip Barton, the hotel director alongside Robert Conrad and Connie Stevens. Troy's fortunes would only get better when Joshua Logan stepped down as director of Parish, paving the way for Delmer Daves, known for directing A Summer Place, to take the helm. The new director immediately went after Troy to assume the movie's lead role. The movie became a smash hit, marking another major milestone in his career. At this point, Troy was idolized nationwide. When I was young, I used to put him in a bottle and see if I could get enough to read by. Continuing his successful collaboration with Daves, Troy starred in another tearjerker, Susan Slade, in 1961. Their partnership continued with Rome Adventure, a charming romance featuring Suzanne Plachette. By 1963, Troy got about 5,000 to 7,500 letters from fans weekly. The next year, movie theater owners voted him the 20th most popular star in America. The actor's fame also traveled overseas, and he was thought of as a typical party type because of his attractive looks. He was the lady's favorite playboy until he took on a different role as a crazy killer in the 1965 movie My Blood Runs Cold, starring alongside Joey Heatherton. Even though Troy was excited to try something new, the audience didn't dig it, and this was the beginning of an upset in his career. Escaping from a sinking ship, Warner Brothers triggered the termination of Troy's deal, which was supposed to last until early 1968. Troy accepted the cancellation, and both parties went apart. I saw you on the cliff, I guess. In an interview, Troy showed appreciation to Warner Brothers for the exposure that he got. But for the first time in his career, he made more money on his own than he ever did during his time under contract in just two years. That same year, Troy was set to star in a Poor Richard production with Alan at the Pheasant Run Playhouse. But in the week leading up to the show, he was always drunk and couldn't focus on his lines. Despite Alan's pleas, Troy walked out a few days before opening night, giving way for Terry Moore as a last-minute replacement. This silly act from Troy got him sued for $200,000 for damages and breach of contract. Fall from glory. Given how fast Troy's once bright career was going down the drain, his manager Wilson thought it would be best to go under a mega-producing house once again at least to help open more doors for the actor. On February 22, 1968, Troy inked a significant long-term deal with Universal Studios, spanning both movies and television. Wilson's plan worked as usual, and over the course of a year, Troy got four roles, including guest appearances on hit shows like Ironside, The Name of the Game, and The Virginian, as well as a TV movie titled The Lonely Profession. However, Troy still could not keep his personal affairs in order and faced a divorce from Allen and various legal battles. Advised by his lawyer due to these challenges, Troy reluctantly filed for bankruptcy on October 1, 1968, ultimately losing his home and relying on the generosity of friends for accommodation. Bersilius intelligent mind! The actor was so off his game that navigating Hollywood's evolving landscape proved daunting for him. Casting directors regularly scrutinized his appearance, questioning changes like his mustache or beard. Additionally, Troy believed his career suffered due to his outspoken democratic stance against the Vietnam War, despite assumptions that he leaned Republican. But then, in a surprising turn of events, he accepted an invitation from the USO to visit Vietnam in 1968, primarily out of necessity. However, the trip was cut short when he was sent home for taking drugs from nurses. Nevertheless, Troy received a Certificate of Appreciation from the Department of Defense in February 1969. Everything seemed to be going southward for the actor, that in late 1969, Troy decided to start afresh and then made a bold move from Los Angeles to New York City, hoping to find solace in the Manhattan apartment of his new wife, Alma Sharp. During his time in the bustling metropolis, Troy took on a role in the daytime CBS drama, The Secret Storm, where he remained for approximately six months, further navigating the twists and turns of his tumultuous career, but still... Sorry to get you up, sir, but we want to get married. His fan base continually went down the drain, hoping that the consistent interviews card would work again. In May 1970, Troy agreed to an interview with Carol Kramer of New York Today, who stated the significant changes in both his appearance and demeanor. 
She also stated that he was no longer the heartthrob adored by fans. And in response to her observations, Troy talked about his newfound interests in astrology, his spiritual beliefs encompassing God and reincarnation, and his experiences with psychoanalysis. This nonchalant attitude would leave him struggling to secure acting roles by 1971, but as usual, Troy would attribute his struggle to the outdated image that Warner Brothers and Universal Studios had imposed on him years prior, compounded by the retirement of his agent, Wilson. Despite his challenges, Troy found himself appearing in low-budget films like The Last Stop and Seizure, which marked Oliver Stone's directorial debut. However, his personal habits would leave him bare once again as he battled with substance abuse and was in financial trouble. Following his separation from Sharp, Troy found himself homeless. They had only asked for our marriage license. Resorting to living in a bush in Central Park and surviving on the kindness of friends and fans. He even tagged along with fans for warm meals or showers, occasionally crashing on their couches or beds. Tired of the humiliation, Troy made a drastic decision to shed his old image, cutting his hair and relocating to Atlanta, Georgia, to take on the role of a cop in Michael Miola's independent film, Without Last Rights. Unfortunately, the project collapsed when funding dried up after a few weeks, leaving Troy and the rest of the cast and crew unpaid. Facing a dearth of acting opportunities, Troy accepted a hosting gig at a fashion show held at the Lafayette Plaza Shopping Center in Bridgeport, Connecticut, on May 26, 1972, in a bid to earn extra income. When questioned about his recent endeavors by the Bridgeport Post, he would either reply that he had either been working hard or just goofing off big time. Amidst Troy's challenging times, an unexpected lifeline emerged from his old schoolmate Francis Ford Coppola, who offered him a small role in The Godfather Part II as Connie Corleone's fiancé, Merle Johnson, a subtle nod to Troy's real name. Despite just a week's worth of work, Troy pocketed a welcome boost of $10,000. Following a lengthy hiatus, Troy made a triumphant return to television with a guest appearance on The Merv Griffin Show in August 1974. Later that year, he relocated back to Los Angeles, and seven months later, he demonstrated his support for a noble cause by attending the Easter Benefit Ball in San Francisco. The event aimed to raise funds for the Easter Seals Society for Crippled Children and Adults of San Francisco with Troy taking charge of the Celebrity Judge panel alongside film stars Jane Withers, Janet Blair, and Terry Moore. Despite lacking studio support and funds for a publicist, Troy found himself at a disadvantage in the entertainment market, and in the summer of 1975, he made a strategic move by licensing his name and image to the New York-based marketing company, First Scene Incorporated, for just $5.98. The company also offered a specially recorded LP album featuring Troy sharing tips on breaking into showbiz, with advertisements for the album appearing in tabloids nationwide. Troy would later make sporadic appearances on television shows like Ellery Queen, The Hardy Boys, and Chips, as well as featuring in whiskey commercials aired on the Japanese television market. It looked like things were starting to settle for him again. Not a bad idea at all. Just tell me one thing. But then, out of the blue, the media got hold of his divorce from Vicki Taylor in 1981, making the actor avoid any form of publicity, fade from the public eye, and lose touch with most of his friends, who grew weary of waiting for him to resurface. The actor hoped to come back on board the entertainment ship, but then he encountered difficulties securing work. A friend even cautioned him that producers were scared of working with him given how sporadic he was and his physical condition. This news left him heartbroken as he spent countless nights parked at the beach in his car. He contemplated suicide at some point, but then he made up his mind to pick up his pieces and start all over. That same year, when Troy achieved sobriety, Aaron Spelling extended a lifeline by offering him his first TV gig in the crime drama series Matt Houston, starring Lee Horsley as a wealthy Texan oilman doubling as a private eye in LA. Troy aced his role, and shortly thereafter, the actor secured a supporting role in the 1984 film Grandview, USA. In between acting gigs, Troy found employment with Holland America Lines, spending two months each year sailing and leading seminars on film and theater improvisation. Though he continued to act in films throughout the 1980s and 90s, he was not able to attain a quarter of the level of fame that he once had. The ionic actor's final movie role came in the 2000 comedy The Boys Behind the Desk, directed by Sally Kirkland. Troy's personal life. 
Troy Donahue lived quite an adventurous life. His personal life was like a movie with mind-blowing plot twists, starting with his relationship with actress Judy Meredith in 1956. This relationship was staged by the Warner Brothers, who organized publicity dates to promote their relationship. However, the fake romance soured, leading to a split in 1958 as Meredith felt Troy was too rough and possessive. The actress would later come out, making accusations that Troy had forcibly pushed her face into a glass-covered picture upon discovering she was dating someone else post-breakup. Indeed, her allegations painted him as an extremely passionate lover, and one would think he really felt something for her. But then it came to light that Troy was involved with Nan Morris during his relationship with Meredith. The actor did not deny the allegations. Instead, he made his relationship with Morris public shortly after his split with Meredith. Troy and Morris even became engaged at one point during their two-year relationship. However, his infidelity, heavy drinking habits, and aggressive nature would later lead to a breakup. There were reports of physical altercations between Troy and Morris, including an incident where Morris was thrown into a pool. That same year, Troy crossed paths with Swedish actress Lily Cardell at a Halloween party. Both celebrities would later become acquaintances on the basis of Troy's roots in the Swedish movie industry. There's a back way through the sculptor's yard. We can sneak in. And by 1960, their connection deepened, leading to an engagement in January 1961. However, just like his past relationships, his bond with Cardell will be short-lived due to allegations of domestic violence and infidelity. Cardell claimed to have found Troy with another woman at his home, resulting in a confrontation where she allegedly slapped him in self-defense. This escalated into a physical altercation, with Troy purportedly punching Cardell, causing her to fall. Troy denied these accusations, but then they stuck as a reputation. As if negative public attention was not enough, Troy's co-star from Surfside 6, Diane McBain, confessed to having an affair with him while he was still with Cardell. The bad press prompted Troy to keep his personal life under wraps, but then a connection that he had found in the last days of 1960, while still in a relationship with Cardell, could no longer be hidden. Troy had crossed paths with actress Suzanne Plachette in New York, and their professional collaboration on Rome Adventure blossomed into a romantic relationship, leading to their engagement announcement on December 2, 1963. They exchanged vows on January 5, 1964 in Beverly Hills, California. However, their marital bliss was also short-lived, as Plachette filed for divorce six months later citing mental cruelty as her reason for wanting a divorce. The divorce was so draining that Troy channeled all his effort into building his career before meeting his second wife, actress Valerie Allen, two years after his divorce during an audition for Come Spy With Me. It was love at first sight, and their love blossomed during filming. People, please hold these while I tell this young lady that I love her beyond... Be resulting in a marriage in Dublin, Ireland on October 21st, 1966. Unfortunately, Allen filed for divorce in April 1968, accusing Troy of extreme cruelty. The divorce was finalized in November 1968, with him agreeing to financial terms including an upfront payment and monthly alimony. Troy's third marriage would be to Executive Secretary Alma Sharp, with their union taking place on November 15, 1969, in Roanoke, Virginia, a year after his second divorce. However, just like his previous marriages and relationships, Troy's marriage to Sharp was short-lived, as she felt frustrated by his social circle and his reluctance to heed her warnings. They eventually separated in the early 1970s at Sharp's request, with their divorce finalized in the summer of 1974. In 1982, a significant revelation reshaped Troy's life when he discovered he had an adult son named Sean from a brief fling back in 1969. The memory of the woman revealing Sean's identity at a gathering remained vivid in his mind as he revealed it to the press in an interview. Since then, Troy and Sean have embarked on the journey of forming a bond, meeting every couple of weeks to nurture their relationship. Then, in early 1987, another surprising turn of events unfolded as Troy received unexpected news about another adult child. A woman named Janine Curtis reached out claiming to be his daughter. Janine discovered Donahue was her biological father after reconnecting with her birth mother who gave her for adoption right after birth. Just like Sean, Troy kept in contact with Janine and bonded with her. The actor's fourth and final marriage was to land developer Vicki Taylor in 1979, 
but their relationship ended in divorce in 1981. But this did not stop the actor from finding love again, this time with opera singer Zheng Tao, whom he had met during a seminar for Holland America, where she also performed as a singer in October 1991. Their relationship led to an engagement, and they resided together in Santa Monica right until his death. Troy Donahue's Tragic Death After years of heavy drinking and drug abuse, the negative effects began to take their toll on Troy's health, leading to pancreatitis. It was so serious that in the summer of 1976, Troy had an episode that left him confined to bed rest for nearly a month. February 1982 marked a pivotal moment in Donahue's life. His addiction problem had reached a critical juncture, and when he attended Julie Newmar's film rap party in a drunken, embarrassing state, he drew unwelcome attention from photographers. Subsequently, he was hospitalized for nearly two weeks due to another episode of pancreatitis. Following his fourth divorce and near-suicide experience, Troy finally confronted his drinking and drug use. In May 1982, he took a decisive step by joining Alcoholics Anonymous, a decision he credited with salvaging his life. Well, I can't speak for the others, but being a pre-med student on a basketball scholarship... Reflecting on his tumultuous journey, Troy acknowledged the perilous path he had been on and committed to change. For nearly two decades, he maintained sobriety until his tragic demise on August 30th, 2001. Despite receiving emergency angioplasty at St. John's Health Center in Santa Monica, California, his battle with heart disease proved insurmountable. He underwent bypass surgery on September 1st, but tragically passed away the following day at the age of 65. He was laid to rest at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Hollywood Hills. During the solemn burial ceremony, guests were astonished as Sean, Donahue's son, made an unexpected appearance, bearing a striking resemblance to his late father. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.